Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Love, head of banking and fintech at Trevelyan. Welcome to another episode of Trevelyan Next, where we profile tech forward people and stories all at the intersection of banking and fintech. Recently, my colleague Keith Daly and I welcomed the Brain Trust from Jam Fintop to our show, including Adam Aspis, general partner at Jam Special Opportunity Ventures, LLC, Matthew Kelly, director Jam Fintop Bank Network, and Ryan Zachariah, COO and director of research and general partner at Jam Special Opportunity Ventures, LLC. Please enjoy the show. So I'll throw it over to you, Adam, just to get a sense and background of Jam Fintop, how it came together, and your role going forward as we move into this year. Thanks, Kiefer and Brian, for having us. So uh, Jam is an investor in financial services uh, coming up on 27-year anniversary. We have a hedge fund, private equity funds, and we invest in U.S. financials, primarily community banks. And it just became obvious to us several years ago that community banks were falling behind the curve on technology and, you know, what could we do about it? And so we formed a new area called JAM Special Opportunity Ventures, or JSOB, to start making those more tech forward investments. We started spending time with people in Silicon Valley and venture capitalists and really trying to think about the future of banking and financial services. And ultimately, that led to a JV with FinTop Capital which is a venture capital firm based in Nashville in St. Louis, where the general partners are all former uh, operators. FinTop stands for Financial Technology Operators. They're former operators, entrepreneurs that built, ran, sold FinTechs. And it's a really impressive group. And we just had a shared vision of the future of financial services in banking and said, you know, we should just do a fund together. So we went out and raised a $150 million fund to invest in bank tech. The unique thing about that fund is that the only LPs in that fund are community banks. So there's 66 community banks in that fund. Collectively, the assets of those 66 community banks is about $650 billion. And we are out raising, you know, we're out investing uh, in mainly Series A uh, technology uh, companies that are the companies that banks need to know about in order to remain relevant and competitive and stay ahead of the curve you know, versus the large money center banks and nimble fintechs. And then subsequent to that, we realized that we also needed a fund for blockchain, that you know, blockchain we believe is the future rails of the financial system. And so we are uh, raising a $200 million fund. We closed on 110 million at the end of December. And that fund uh, has added more banks into the network. So we now have 79 banks uh, and over a trillion in assets when you look at the banks across the network. And we're super engaged with the network, talking with them about their pain points, opportunities uh, across you know, webinars, conferences, committees, uh, tech surveys. And that's just led to a tremendous, tremendous amount of uh, flywheel network effects when we make investments and how we introduce the fintechs to our network of banks. No, that's great, Adam. And it's so nice to see uh, community banks being proactive um, and not reactive to the uh, technology uh, coming down the pike. Uh, so I'm flipping over to, to Matt. So the bank tech, very interesting. Um, we know a lot of your, your LPs, your investors. And uh, what kind of technology are lo you looking at, Matt? And also when you talk to the you know, 79 banks or 66 banks that are investing in the bank tech, what are their, what have you seen kind of market research wise? What's the feedback you're getting from those banks? Yeah, Keith and, and Brian, great to be here with this afternoon and really appreciate uh, spending some time to, to delve into what we're working on. And um, great respect for Trevelyan as well, uh, having been, worked at Thank a couple you. of prior firms that have engaged with you and uh, helping identify the, the great talent out there for the banking industry. It's an important part, and I'm sure we'll get to um, here in our conversation uh, this afternoon. But we started in the bank tech fund, really just understanding what these banks and what our LP partners are working on. And that included a pretty extensive tech stack survey, but more importantly, just one-on-one -on -one conversations, you know, what's on your strategic whiteboard. And we spent the summer and, and the spring and the summer kind of digging into that and putting together this mosaic of really the top areas that we should be focused on their behalf. 
And if you look at those kind of five or six areas, number one was really uh, going fully digital in deposit gathering and lending. There's still just a lot of work to be done on improving the process, the basic building blocks of banking. How do you open up a fully digital consumer bank account on the deposit side, and then do that again on the on the commercial side and the SMB side. So it started with this effort of digitizing everything, the core building blocks, the core products of banking. And then it kind of went into this process improvement bucket. And this one's really important. And these are fintechs that are going into one part of the bank, one process um, that is antiquated and is has plenty of room for improvement in throughput, plenty of room in improvement for efficiency and cost savings. And so that process improvement bucket has led us to a couple of initial investments in the bank tech fund, which I'll outline in a minute or two. Uh, payments was, was a third one. You know, payments is very top of mind. We have a lot of changes coming down the pipe. It's complicated, you know, when you really start to dig into what banks are looking for in payments, it's a, a lot more complex. Uh, RTP, FedNow are coming. Uh, Zelle and P2P is easy, but how do you implement some of these new products in your core commercial bank? That's that's a lot more complex. And so, but payments is an area that the LPs kind of raise their hand and in conversations, they're looking for ways to be at the front end, edge and, and not be left behind. And so payments was an area. FinTech partnerships, how do you find new pockets of growth? I mean, ultimately, um, the managers, the boards of these banks, they want to be operating institutions that are leveraging capital in a more efficient way and driving outsized returns. I mean, that's the holy grail that everybody's after. I mean, you look at your tech forward bank index and you look at what's happening with these 20, 30, 40 banks and everybody's tracking in the public markets that have broken out to this new valuation type level that gives them a huge structural advantage to raise capital and to grow and finance growth and acquire with that, that benefit. And so these banks and these boards are looking for ways to get on that higher growth plane. And fintech partnerships and banking as a service has been a, a huge area of focus. And this is what the banks wanted to talk about. You know, They can see this uh, need coming. They can see the volume of deposits that's being generated in fintech land that requires you know, a bank sponsor to be part of what they're doing. Uh, and, and they wanna be engaged in that. And so fintech partnerships is a big one. And then you know, a couple of other areas around data security and compliance and, and managing oversight and all the onboarding you know, function and, and cybersecurity and fraud, like these are very top of mind. So those were kind of the, the top five areas. You know, uh, I noticed this week that Cornerstone had their uh, kind of outlook piece out. It's a, it's a great piece. Would recommend yeah. it. And the top five areas on you know where and banks focused on uh, system selections, replacements. It's consumer digital, commercial digital, loans, deposits, uh, and and CRM. I mean, there's some basic building block upgrades that are happening every day, and a lot of great tools uh, for banks of different sizes to consider. And those are the fintechs that we're looking at. So. So far, we have made nine investments uh, and partnerships. Very excited about those. They're all kind of outlined on our website. They all dovetail on a couple of those themes uh, that are out there and a lot more work to be done. But uh, my role here at Jam Fintop is really working with uh, this growing list of uh, LPs kind of in our network. And we are investors first, as Adam pointed out, in these two different strategies. But we also want to be consultative and helpful and engaged and just learning what these banks are working on. And that type of feedback is just so powerful as we start to invest on their behalf. No, that's great. And uh, I watched the, did you watch the webinar, for the Cornerstone? It was uh, Eric Sprink and Steve yep. Schnall. Yeah, and we saw what you were talking about, but also the first, uh, the first slide or second slide was biggest concern was uh, talent. Went yep. from, I think 20%, 20% last year, 2019, for biggest concern to like 69%. So that kind of leads me over to you, Brian Love. If, I know you had a couple of uh, talent questions you wanted to jump in there with, since that is our, our forte there. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate it. And thanks, thanks for joining us, everyone, on this call. Um, it's really exciting to talk to you all. And uh, you're doing something, you know, pretty unique. Obviously, uh, Trevelyan kind of bobs and weaves in a similar network to you. And I was really excited to see how talent kind of, you know, feeds into your business. It's clear from our, from all of our friends in the banking as a service space 
that risk and compliance is always hot topic. And Matt, you just mentioned how, you know, that's part of your fun too. I just wanted to throw that out to you and just kind of see how, how talent, um, how talent's important, you know, to jam FinTop. Yeah, I'll start just kind of what we're seeing with some of the banks in our network. They're building new things. They're building new relationships. They're, they're going into new products and new segments that they haven't been in the past. And that's really exciting because the, uh, the total addressable market, when you're starting to point your institution at a new consumer set, a new commercial focus, a new affinity group, uh, a new niche segment, those are big, exciting opportunities that banks need to go after aggressively. Uh, but when you start to do that, you do need to bring together teams of talent that come from different backgrounds and have different mm -hmm. skills and can move at a different pace. And so the pace at which the fintechs want to move at um, and, and some of the bank tech vendors as well. I mean, we are seeing the need to build these teams internally that have expertise from traditional type banking lines, understand the complexity of operating in a regulated industry, but you also have to have the staff that can weave together these partnerships with new technologies and emerging technologies and put them in a room and get them working together. And you have this little you know, SWAT team of talent. That's what we're seeing get built inside of a lot of the banks mm. and, and the, uh, the banks that are in your tech forward you know, uh, bank group, the index there, they're building these SWAT teams internally that can be more agile and they can go after and identify you know, new business segments. And I think that's you know, super exciting. And that's one of the markers um, you know, of the institutions that are starting to break out into these new growth trajectories and these new profitability planes that, that is exciting. But the other thing I would say is it really just starts at the top. I mean, many of these banks have a CEO and a board who have just put a, a stake in the ground and they have made it clear to their teams internally and to the investor community um, that they're going to break from the pack and go after new ways to achieve outsized profitability. And so it starts that senior leadership then you build your SWAT groups and SWAT teams internally. And we're seeing this happen uh, at a much more frequent pace inside of what we view as the more innovative banks across the landscape, including you know, some of the LPs in our fund. Yeah, the, the one thing I'd add is that we knew that when we got into this, the importance of having the right partners. And so you know, FinTop has expertise in venture capital investing. It's what they've been doing for forever and former operators. You know, John Philpott, the third employee of S1, really the first internet bank from 25 plus years ago. Uh, Rick Cashel and Joe Maxwell having sold companies to Blackstone. Uh, Jim McKelvey, the co-founder of Square. I mean, we knew we had the right partners to do this and that was just critical to our success. And then when we got into blockchain, it was partnering with Figure, who's a blockchain holding company. CEO is Mike Cagney, the founder of SoFi. They built their own blockchain. I mean, you know, they're a thought leader in the industry and just having the right partners uh, because it's such a fast evolving world is just critical to, to being successful. That's kind of a perfect transition to Ryan um, <laughs> and a uh, subject that I am fascinated with, um, blockchain kind of emerging technologies, how this technology is gonna change banking and then um, Adam actually sent me a, a couple resources. I watched Mike Cagney. Thank you for that, Adam, on a YouTube video talking about his blockchain at Figure. It's really fascinating. I don't even feel like I understand any of it right now, but <laughs> I'm getting there. Every day I'm reading more about it. But Ryan would love to kind of hear your thoughts on the new blockchain fund and the technologies, especially uh, coming down the pike that are just going to revolutionize kind of what we're seeing out there banking wise. Yeah, so um, echo Adam and Matt's sentiments. Thanks for, for having us on. Um, you know, as, as both Adam and Matt talked about, so much of what we do is centers around engagement uh, with our banks. And so, um, you know, when we closed our bank tech fund, uh, the feedback um, that we got off of the tech stack surveys and some of the conversations we were having is that, some of their uh, biggest uh, strategic imperatives, some of the things that the banks were focused on the most uh, were things that might be best solved for down the line by blockchain technology. And so those are things like real-time payments um, and process automation. Uh, at the same time, we felt like, you know, it's an emergent technology. It's still very, very early days. 
And so we wanted to have kind of a dedicated lane to make those investments. And that's when this idea of the JAM Fintop blockchain was born. Um, and so taking a step back, I mean, we think blockchain uh, does have the power to be transformative, does have the power to be over the next decade, the dominant uh, operating infrastructure for financial services. Um, and that's really because of a couple of key characteristics that blockchain provides. Um, it replaces trust with truth. So a lot of the intermediation that's very um, common and frequent in financial services, things like escrow agents and pay agents and um, uh, servicing processes uh, could conceivably be replaced by um, you know, programmable uh, uh, contracts that exist on chain. Um, you know, it can be cheaper, it can be faster, it can be scaled up, it could be programmable, um, it's real time, uh, and it can facilitate the bilateral settlement of transactions. So, um, you know, I think while a lot of financial institutions uh, appreciate and understand the potential, at the same time, there are a couple of um, key aspects um, you know, in this kind of emergent technology that are big question marks, primarily around regulation and cybersecurity. And so, you know, we kind of appreciated that and said, okay, if we take a step back and realize that there are these structural impediments to the adoption of something that has the power to be um, transformative and enhance the customer experience and make banks um, more profitable and customers happier, um, you know, how do we solve for that? Um, and, you know, we evaluated the landscape. Uh, we did, um, you know, speak with figure a lot and, and understand that there were, um, you know, technologies that were being created that, um, you know, could operate uh, regulated financial services businesses on chain, that it didn't have to be all about anonymity. Um, it didn't all have to be about speculation or cryptocurrency, that there were um, you know, real financial use cases that were being put into action, some of which were kind of gestated um, and demonstrated by, by figure. Um, but at the same time, there's still a lot of infrastructure to be built. So if digital assets are going to grow um, and go beyond just cryptocurrencies right now, which is basically all that digital assets are, and it's going to eventually encompass things like equities and loans and digital identity NFTs um, and fixed income securities, then there's this whole infrastructure layer that needs to be built, um, basically replacing, you know, many decades of financial technology that that's been built for the traditional financial services industry. And those are things like data solutions and compliance, KYC, BSA tools, uh, know your transaction tools, um, on-chain identity uh, tools, uh, ways to bridge legacy information and legacy systems to bring it on-chain via data oracles, uh, and then uh, digital asset custody. So uh, with the explosive growth that we expect out of digital assets, there needs to be um, a secure and credible way for uh, customers to, to hold those assets secure um, and and that infrastructure is kind of in the process of being built out, but we think that there's a lot of, of it that is still on the come. And it's only once that infrastructure is built out that you can really lean in on some of the kind of killer app um, or use cases, things like exchanges and marketplaces, um, you know, revol revolutionizing things like the back office and insurance and lending and payments and asset management. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's almost, I mean, between that and metaverse and, oh man, there's, there's so much going on, but it's exciting. Sure. I think it's, it's incredibly exciting. Uh, I just read Walmart was building their own metaverse, uh, I guess, where you go in there and put on the goggles or something and go shopping. But I think we're heading closer to the, the Matrix and uh, <laughs> Terminator or whatever else we were, you know, watching when we were kids. But Ryan, what, I know there was a big, uh, transaction last week. Could you tell me a little bit about Stablecoin and the uh, USDF consortium? Because uh, I sure. think this is really important for banks uh, to yeah. understand and be a part of. Yeah, and I, look, I view this as kind of an extension of our efforts to engage um, with and on behalf of our uh, community bank 
um, and regulated financial institution, limited partners. Um, so, you know, it has always been our perspective that there's a role for traditional financial services to play um, in the broader kind of decentralized finance ecosystem. And, and uh, what that role ultimately looks like, we don't know for sure, um, but we do believe that uh, there need to be at a minimum regulated on ramps and off ramps. And so we think that banks have a role to play here. Um, and, you know, if you look at kind of the existing construct for stablecoin, it's largely issued by um, private enterprises um, and it's used for um, some pretty narrow use cases right now. The DeFi use cases are all in or around cryptocurrency. So it's getting leverage on cryptocurrency or generating yield on cryptocurrency. Um, but we think kind of the power of stablecoin is in its ability to um, transfer value on chain um, and enable a lot of these um, you know, ultimate applications like, you know, the real-time bilateral settlement of securities transactions without, you know, brokering or intermediation or escrow agents for people to verify investor suitability because all of that's being done, um, you know, through the smart contracts. And so, um, you know, ahead of the president's working group report, um, you know, it was our perspective that there was a role for banks to play um, in stablecoin issuance and the president's working group report on stablecoins, I think kind of uh, further solidified our view there that that banks, um, you know, should be the mentors of stablecoins. And so um, the USDF consortium is stood up with uh, uh, five founding bank members um, figure um, and ourselves, Jam Fintop. Um, and it's really established to create a low friction um, way for banks to mint, burn, and transfer the USDF stablecoin. And the USDF stablecoin can be used in all of the decentralized applications that are built right now um, on provenance or that will be built. And it's differentiated from kind of private company issued stablecoin because it exists within the bank regulatory construct. So it's minted exclu exclusively by banks. Um, it's redeemable on a one for one basis for cash from consortium members. Uh, it can't be transferred to wallets unless they have a passport that's been issued by a bank consortium member. Um, and that is effectively evidencing uh, the fact that the wallet has been appropriately KYC'd. Um, and it addresses just a lot of the kind of consumer protection and regulatory concerns that exist with the current stable of stable coins. And so, you know, we're excited, um, you know, to be a part of that initiative and, and you know, hope that, um, you know, it, it scales nicely over the next 12 months. Yeah, and I saw, um, was it last week was the first transaction um, between uh, New York Community Bank and MBH Bank. So that's uh, very exciting. Um, yep. Yeah, so any kind of advice, uh, I'll go over to, uh, to Matt. Uh, right now, kind of banks that might feel a little, or Adam, uh, feel a little overwhelmed with all this information. Um, what are some good like first steps, uh, you know, to learn or you know reach out to you guys, of course, for information. But uh, a lot of this is really brand new, especially to community banks. Um, do you have any advice on kind of first steps to take on this uh, digital asset adventure? <laughs> Go ahead, Adam. Let you start. Yeah. So, you know, just the mindset. You know, banks have to be willing to accept. You know, what the future of banking is, and that we're really moving from being constrained by geography to a world where banking is open, embedded, industry specialized, and is moving to cloud-based cores, artificial intelligence, and the the world that banks knew of cores that were built before the internet that were built for a branch teller of an ACH system that was built in 1974 are going to be obsolete. And so we're looking to work with banks that are looking to lean in to modern tech stacks. And you know, we believe that those banks will be rewarded in the capital markets, the ones that are publicly traded with higher multiples, the ones that are private with higher ROEs. And you know, there's we, we really started this journey as being 
somewhat bearish and nervous about the future of banking. And where I'd say we are today is we couldn't be more enthusiastic and optimistic about the future of banking, but it's, but it's for the banks that are willing to have an innovation mindset and lean into that future, which includes everything from cloud-based cores to blockchain rails to spinning up digital banks and partnering with fintechs. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to, you know, your tech forward index goes back to these banks that we just think are the tip of the iceberg for banks who are exploring new ways to operate and new business lines and new partnerships. And, you know, you start to look at some of these institutions and, you know, Silvergate and Signature in digital assets and blockchain and crypto and supporting that industry, it's just explosive growth. You look at Triumph Bank in payments, you look at MVB and Coastal in fintech partnerships and banking as a service um, that is driving deposits and fees. And, um, you know, it's a whole world of private banks, many of which you guys have represented uh, for some searches for key, you know, elements of their leadership team to grow in these exact same areas. So we're of the view that this is just getting started. And, you know, um, Christine from Treasury Prime, uh, we had him on with some of our LPs recently, and we're talking about just banking as a service is one conversation. And right now there's anywhere between 50 and 70 banks that have at least one type of relationship out there. An estimate of you know, 30 to $50 billion of FinTech originated deposits that are sitting on a regulated bank balance sheet in a bin sponsorship, uh, deposit sponsorship, basic building blocks of bringing together a FinTech and a regulated bank working together in a, a partnership type of model. And Chris is of the view that that's going to a trillion dollars, you know, over the next five to 10 years. And at a trillion dollars, you know, that would be somewhere between four and 5% of uh, the total deposit base for this country of, of 16 or 17 trillion um, is where we stand right now. So it's not a crazy number, but a trillion dollars is a real big, exciting hmm. opportunity. And so it's no wonder that you're seeing just a ton of banks want to start to lean into Adam's point. They want to take a flyer and say, how does this work? What's going on? What are these banks doing differently? Where do I find my niche? And that's what I think is really exciting. And so it's a small piece of what we see in the public marketplace today and the private marketplace today. But we think the runway for growth is, is really long and, and the opportunity to kind of interface with um, you know, new avenues of growth, new customers, new revenue models, new products, new integrations, new embedded banking, you know, type of applications. It's all starting. And, um, you know, our fund and our LPs are, are kind of at the forefront of that. And we want to talk to more banks. And so we talk to banks all day, every day about their innovation game plan and roadmap and want to continue to do so and um, would encourage uh, banks to reach out and um, would, would love to love to spend some time with you. Yeah, I'll just add, if the banks do want to reach out uh, to go to jamfintop.com and uh, they can reach us there. Great. I know, Brian, you had a... No, that question. seems like a, a, a nice spot to end right there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then the, the, the guy has to ask the other question about recruiting. Maybe we'll edit this to be earlier. Um, well, I mean, you obviously, Matt, you were talking about the real distinction of of ten billion dollar banks and less under that you know that that aren't you know susceptible to the Dur the Durban um, piece that's where they can really thrive in this payment space um, and so we deal with a lot of banks that are you know getting into it there we help them you know create job descriptions we help them talk through compensation and so there's kind of a little bit of a quagmire of of some banks jumping into this doing it the right way. And can they repurpose their own talent? So, you know, problem, maybe, maybe not, depending on how niche that this is. And I'm just curious your perspective on what you've heard. Um, seems like we used to want to hire generalists and now we have to hire, you know, very specific talent. So any anecdotes, you know, from, from your dealings with, with these banks on, along repurposing talent, uh, et cetera? Yeah, I think it starts with a vision of a new product or a new segment that you're trying to go after. You have to you know, have that end goal in mind of what are you trying to build and, and what are the building blocks and, and how do you staff it accordingly to actually execute to go from A to Z. And so um, you know, we're seeing banks that want to interface with middleware and, and 
SaaS type providers. This is just one area of what we're working on, you know, on the bank tech fund, but it's an exciting area. Um, I think it is more than just uh, Durban exempt banks under 10 billion. There's a lot of exciting things in credit products and payments and access to the Fed payments network and embedded payments and the merchant side as a whole you know, major opportunity for banks to potentially re-engage on, on some of those applications. Uh, and there's a lot of banks that are building, you know, pretty neat partnerships and new business lines and uh, their own in-house, you know, type of um, platform models. I think about Sterling Bank, I think about Synovus and, you know, First Horizon, these types of institutions, they're standing up and building new things. And those new things require um, inside talent, that know how to work around, you know, the current systems that are in place in these big organizations, but you also need, you know, that new talent that can come from the outside. So I, I think it's a mix. And Adam, what did I miss there? I, I just think the key is that a technologist has to be at the C-suite level, right? So in many years ago, uh, technologists were buried in operations and they need to have a seat at the table on the, stra the, the strategy from the top down uh, for the company. And you know we see CEOs that are starting to lean in, pushing this strategy down to the employees, and that many, many companies are seeing their employees that they did not know were tech forward, getting really engaged and excited about where the company is headed and you know, wanting to participate in that future. And so um, you know, we wanna see that engagement at, at the highest level. Uh, we believe strongly that the future CEOs of banking are all going to be technologists. Um, we talked about, you know, new roles that you could be hiring on behalf of, you know, the more innovative banks out there. Number one, we talked about fintech partnerships. Number two, I, I think small business and fully digital, maybe even on a national scale, um, is going to be something that banks will be yeah. staffing up on because they recognize they're going to have to go after it in a different way. So it's one thing to have a whole bunch of small business operating accounts, and that's nice from a core funding perspective, but the competition that is coming for the real margin in that business, which is payments and credit. So think about Shopify, think about buy now, pay later, think about point of sale financing, think about Brex. Brex has an $11 billion valuation as a private company. Uh, that's almost the equivalent of Comerica, you know, a couple of weeks ago, it's big. And so that's the competition that's coming for small business. And you're starting to see the tools that are getting put in place for banks to say, you know what, it's time that we can re-engage, invest in some technology and really go after that. We can go after that in our local markets with the industries we're familiar with, and we could potentially go after it on a broader level as well. And so I think small business uh, lending gets a lot more attention. I think it's staffed up in a different way. Um, and then all the way up the corporate, you know, treasury type functions. And so FX, moving money around, um, accounts payable and cash management. You know, this is an area we're seeing a lot of really innovative companies that are bringing new tools that's going to allow a corporate treasury, um, you know, type department to offer new types of services with margin. And so those are just a couple that I could think of that, uh, you might see, you know, more type of search activity happening as banks are looking to allocate resources in those areas that will require, you know, the human talent to execute with. That's again, it's great response. Good, good thoughts there. And if we were, we're so uh, inundated with, you know, risk compliance, you know, senior level searches around regulatory right now, it's obvious that's ba banks are trying to bolster those teams so that, you know, nobody gets slapped on the wrists. Um, in any event, uh, thanks so much for, for those thoughts, guys. No, I really appreciate it. It's great picking the, uh, the brains of you know, top talents, kind of innovators who are looking forward. And we, we all have the same mission. Um, you know, we want to see community banks thrive. I mean, they've gone from, what was the stat, Brian, 20,000 banks to less than 5,000 now. Um, so like any other industry, they need to innovate. So it's fantastic to see your fund and investors taking a, like I said before, a proactive approach to this because the technology is coming fast. It's a, <laughs> every day I feel like I'm reading about something new uh, within the tech world, NFTs and something about Gucci NFTs today. I don't even know, but uh, yeah, no, thank you everybody. And uh, really appreciate it. As Matthew, Ryan and Adam said before, if you're interested in speaking with them, uh, go to their website, Jam Fintop. You can always reach out to Brian or me at uh, trillion.com, trillionengroup.com. 
and we can put you in touch with uh, somebody at Jam Fintop. But look forward to uh, speaking with you again, maybe in six months to a year to see kind of what has shifted over the previous six months and where we're going uh, in the next six months. So really appreciate it again, guys, and uh, have a wonderful uh, January, end to January, and uh, talk to you soon. Thank you.